<laughs> it was on. <laughs> Good evening. It's time to begin our services. Would you please bow with me? Dear God, our Lord and Father in heaven, we're thankful, Father, for you making it possible for each one of us to be here this evening. We pray, Father, that you would go with us as we go into this service, and we pray, Father, that everything that is done here, here this evening will be in harmony with your will. We ask you, Father, that you would be with Jerry and Kathy and space to be with Kathy and her family and the loss of her brother. We pray, Father, that you would be with Larry and Sue and that you would bless and strengthen them and return them to their health and also be with Steve and Jean Graber and there are many more. We pray, Father, that you would just take care of each one of them and take care of their individual needs for you know what they are. We ask you, Father, that you would guide, guard, and direct us through this day and through our lives. We ask you, Father, that you would forgive us for our sins and in death save us for this prayer we'd ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry, I We want to provide the opportunity for those who didn't have the privilege of partaking the Lord's table this morning to do that this evening. Um, remembering Christ's sacrifice that he made um, and that uh, in our stead for, for me and for you. Please bow with me. Saint Father, we come before you now asking your blessing upon the bread representing the body of your son who who you sent and he willingly came and suffered the death on the cross there for us that we could have a hope of eternity with you in heaven. We ask you to be with those that are partaking in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we'll pray for the fruit of the vine. Dear Father, we ask you your blessing upon the fruit of the vine representing the blood that your son shed in our stead that we could be forgiven of our sins, that we could wash clean of our sins and, and spend and be in eternity with you forever. We ask that you, again, be with the ones that are partaking. In Jesus' name, amen. And the tray is still in the back if you have a need for contribution. Good evening. So we'll begin our service with number 388, Take Time to Be Holy. Take time to be holy, speak up with thy Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessings to seek. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with alone, abiding in Jesus, like him thou shalt be, thy friends and thy conduct, his likeness shall see, take time to be holy, be in thy soul each thought and 
and each motive beneath his control. Thus led by his spirit to fountains of love, thou soon shall be fitted for service above. Now we'll sing. <laughs> now we'll sing number 509. Paradise Valley. <clears throat> As I travel through life with the trouble and strife, I've a glorious hope to give cheer on the way. Soon my toil will be o'er, and I'll rest on that shore where the night has been turned into day. Up in the valley of Paradise Valley by the side of the river of life. Up in the valley, the wonderful valley will be free from all pain and all strife. There we shall live in the rose-tinted garden neath the shade of the evergreen tree. How I long for the Paradise Valley where the beauty of heaven I'll see. As I roam the hillside or I list to the tide as I pluck the sweet flowers that grow sweet in the dell, a faint picture is there of a land bright and fair where perennial flowers ne'er fall. Up in the valley full paradise valley by the side of the river of life. Up in the valley the wonderful valley will be free from all pain and all strife. There we shall live in the rose tinted garden neath the shade of the evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise valley where the beauty of heaven I'll see. Though your garden is rare, it is not to compare with the flowers that bloom in the garden above. In the midst of it grows Sharon's perfect sweet rose. Tis the wonderful flower of love. Up in the beautiful paradise valley by the side of the river of life. Up in the valley, the wonderful valley will be free from all pain and all strife. There we shall live in the rose-tinted garden neath the shade of the evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise valley where the beauty of heaven I'll see. It is, uh, again, good to be here, just as it was this morning. Uh, we have Rich and Teresa with us. Glad you're here. have Linda with us here as well. Uh, thankful for that. Uh, Larry got moved up a few seats. I told him uh, that I don't have to be as loud. And, uh, so, but it is good for us to be able to gather here, uh, be able to put our focus upon God, and hopefully we'll be able to do that in this lesson as well, that in all that we do, our focus is upon God. And so if you've been here the last several uh, Sunday evenings, now we've had some breaks, we've had a few other things being taught and discussed Sunday evening, but gen generally speaking, on Sunday evenings we would had lessons talking about worship. And in those discussions, in those studies going through God's Word, uh, those sermons, we have looked at the different acts of worship. And so we covered every act of worship except for giving. And that's what we're going to do hopefully tonight and, Lord willing, next Sunday evening. Uh, we'll talk about giving to the Lord. And so there may be a few verses you know uh, that pertain to giving. 
Uh, and you can think of those in the New Testament. Of course, that is what we are under. Uh, but this lesson is a little bit different, and it will be. Uh, we'll have a little bit more reading than we did this morning. Uh, the morning lesson only had two points. Tonight we'll have three. And uh, again, the verses are a bit longer. But when you and I think about giving, we can think about James 1.17. That reminds us that every good and perfect gift is given to us by God. And what that reminds us is that he is the giver of all good things. So as it comes to, as we talk about each and every act of worship, as we talk about this aspect of us giving back to God, we really can think about all that he has given us. And when we truly appreciate as a Christian, as someone who's received salvation, a member of the church, what God has blessed us with, then this should not be a hard topic. This should be something that we're thankful and glad to do. And again, we know that from the New Testament, it tells us that we are to be a cheerful giver. Now, the things we're going to discuss this evening is God's expectations. That's the first thing we're going to see. And when discussing that, what we're going to talk is that God expects our best, that God expects uh, perhaps even the first. And it's going to, we're going to look at the example of Abel and his offering to God. And the second point, we're going to talk about God's approval. And what it is that God approves of is God's people had gave more uh, than was perhaps expected. They gave abundantly, and God did not turn them away, did not tell them to keep more for themselves. But yet God uh, accepted such a giving. And lastly, the third point, God's challenge, what we're going to see is there's perhaps a challenge God gave to his people, again, of all the good and wonderful, perfect gifts he had gave them, uh, of if you think for a moment that you need to be hesitant, that you need to hold back, and that God somehow won't continue to bless you, you have the wrong kind of mindset of, well, I would give God more, uh, but, but I think we're on the same playing field now. And now I think we, we're at a standstill, God and I. But yet God is encouraging, again perhaps challenging, his people uh, to give. Uh, and that he would then open up the skies for them and continue to offer such wonderful blessings to them. We do not give simply because we want to help. We give as a means of glorifying God. It's about our focus. So tonight we will consider passages and events from the Old Testament that will help us better understand the way God views our gifts. And so hopefully, uh, and again, this will perhaps be different from a typical uh, lesson. We've had a few lessons on giving and the importance of it. Uh, again, many of you perhaps know those passages in the New Testament uh, for the Christian, how it is we are to give. But these things are important as well. So if you have your Bibles with you, if you turn to Hebrews 11.4. Again, it's in the New Testament, but it talks about Abel and Cain, so a, an Old Testament event. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, and to talk about the two different offerings that was uh, given unto the Lord. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. God's expectations. Hebrews 11, 4. It says this. By faith... Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and, though it, and through it he being dead still speaks. While Abel ha has certainly been long gone, and while there are certainly others through Scripture, just like we talked about uh, of Stephen, uh, just as we talked about Solomon this morning, yet there are still lessons from them, and by those lessons they're still teaching us, still speaking to us. And so this reminds us of the event where Cain and Abel were to offer up a sacrifice before God. Here in Hebrews 11, it calls his sacrifice an excellent uh, sacrifice, a more excellent sacrifice. But when we read Genesis, we're told that Abel gave the firstborn of his flock while Cain offered fruit of the ground. There's not a, a distinguish of, of what fruit of the ground he gave. Uh, may have been something he just picked up along the way. But yet... Uh, Abel gave of the firstborn. There was some significance to it uh, of taking from what he was first given. He didn't keep that for himself and say, well, I need to make sure I get through the winter. Well, I need to make sure I get through today. But yet that firstborn was given unto the Lord. Abel gave to God first before seeking his share. And typically speaking, our first is our best. 
Uh, and, and the best way to perhaps understand that is uh, many of you perhaps gone somewhere. Um, perhaps it's been uh, somewhere uh, that's a fast food like McDonald's, or perhaps it's somewhere you can sit down and you have a nice meal. Uh, you're very thankful for it. But there's just too much food that comes out to you. It's nice and hot. It's, that's the best time that it is served to you. And you just can't eat it all. And so you take it home with you. You have leftovers for you. Yes, you can warm it back up. But it's never going to be as good as when it first came to you. And so of understanding uh, the attitude we have in giving to God. That we not look at giving God leftovers, that we not look at giving to everything else, taking care of uh, the payments uh, that surround our lives perhaps first, but of giving God a priority in our life, as we talked this morning, that God ought to be the priority in all things. And so there's a few more things we'll talk about, and uh, in this point about giving to God uh, first, uh, considering uh, God such a priority in our life. Uh, there are a few people that have gone through uh, the Dave Ramsey course. Perhaps you've heard us talk about it for uh, uh, when we go to offer that class. But in that class, it, it talks about the importance of giving. And they have an opportunity for you to download an app on your phone. And the very first thing, and I believe even on the paper format, they have you fill out is your giving to the church. Yes, on that sheet there are things such as bills, as paying for your car, paying for your home. Those things are certainly necessary. Those things have to be done. Those people expect to be paid. But the very first thing is to give to God. And so uh, of you and I being able to, as we have the opportunity, as we prosper, as we know the New Testament talks about, but that you and I would have such a mindset, an attitude uh, of giving God our best, of not what just happens to be left over and then grudgingly give to God, perhaps, but we would have an attitude that we'd be thankful for all that God has given us, and we give it to Him. As far as, again, talking about His expectations, now, again, this is for what He expected those people of that day in the Old Testament, but turn to Leviticus 27. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30 through 33. Leviticus 27, 30-33, and we can see here in the Old Testament where that uh, expectation of the 10% rule came into play. Where, and that's when they use the word tithe, that's what is meant by tithe, is 10%. But to understand these people gave 10% of everything, of just how important it was to give back to God. And we're going to perhaps, hopefully, remind you as well of this, but... If you do the math, you take 100% minus 10, what's that leave you with? It leaves you with 90%. That's still a good portion. That's well over 50%. But yet for these people, all they were asked was to give 10% of everything. Leviticus 27, 33 it reads this. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the, of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wants at all to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one-fifth to it. And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. And if he exchanges it at all, then both it and the one exchange for it shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. You can't have your sheep lined up in such a way that, well, the tenth one is my best sheep, and so I don't want that to go to the Lord's house. I want to keep that for me. But as you have your sheep lined up, and every tenth one would be taken, would be uh, considered uh, to be set aside, would be holy. And so they were to give of their herd, their animals. They were to give a tenth uh, of uh, the fruit of the land. They were to do these things. And that's what God expected of his people of that day. Under the law of Moses, they were to give a tenth of their produce and a tenth of their sheep. Again, as Christians, we are not told that we must give 10% to God. If you study the New Testament when it talks about giving, you will not find that to be a standard for us, or perhaps even an expectation for us. But even if we did give 10%, again, that still means that you and I get to keep back 90% for us. It's about the attitude. It's about the mindset you and I have. Again, we're nowhere told that, and there are some who do not have the ability, some do not have the opportunity 
to give 10%. And so God's not going to be upset with you if you don't meet some kind of standard of 10%, if you give more than that. If all you can give is 1%, if all you can give is 5%, and you do that cheerfully, uh, then and you're doing it for the right reason, with God as your priority in life, then he's going to be thankful for that. You're going to be faithful and obedient, acceptable, pleasing in his sight. But because we are under the new covenant, which is a much greater covenant than the Old Testament, something for us to consider is, oh, why wouldn't we want to give as much as we can? That as God's people who have received salvation, people who are part of the church, uh, people who can never pay back God for what he's done for us, that if we prosper, if we have the ability and opportunity, why would we not give to God as much as as we can. Now, again, that may show up in different forms and fashions. Again, yesterday we had a work day. There are other things going on that people can get involved in. Some people may give of their time, their ability to teach a, a Bible class. Some people may, again, help out here with things. Uh, and for others, it may be that, that financial aspect that they're able to help out with. But you and I ought to understand the reason behind our giving. Ought to think before we give. We've talked about prayer, we've talked about singing, and paying attention to the words. When we sing, to really think about it, what we're singing about. Not to just sing and say, well, we did an act of worship that we would think about. And so as it comes to giving, you and I would think, why is it that I'm giving? I understand that it's required of a Christian, a member of the church, to give, and it's not so that uh, the things on our budget sheet get taken care of, uh, I don't think Andy will mind. I shared with Andy uh, a financial sheet from the back, handed it to him. The first thing he saw was up there was the minister's salary. And he, goes, he said, they pay you for this? Sometimes. But yes, there are those things that have to be taken care of, the ma- maintaining the building, the other uh, individuals that get paid and things that get taken care of. Those are wonderful things. We send money to India. We, take, we send money to buy the battery. We help the World Video Bible School with uh, their internet evangelism campaign of doing those things. Those are good things because God's people have given to the church. But if you're giving so that the preacher can be paid, if you're giving so that we can send money to buy the battery, if that becomes your focus, you can have the opportunity where you'll start to say, well, enough money is going to buy a battery. I'm going to hold back. Well, there's enough money going to India. We don't really need to give any more. Well, the preachers make enough. We don't really need to give any more. But to understand that those things ought not to be the reason why we give. We give because we are all servants to God. And so, again, as we have the opportunity, as we have the ability, each and every one of us ought to give as we prosper, and we ought to give cheerfully. So we can talk about God's expectations, again, concerning us and the church Christians today, God's people. But if you turn to 2 Chronicles, chapter 31, here we're going to see God's approval. And again, this is talking about an abundance. God's people who gave an abundance, and there were heaps of just the offering being stored. That's how much these people had gave abundantly. 2 Chronicles, chapter 31, 5 through 12. What we'll see here is, again, is an outpouring of generosity. An outpouring of generosity. 2 Chronicles chapter 31, 5 through 12. Again, this is a longer bit of scripture, but I think it's all very important. It starts off saying this. As soon as the commandment was circulated, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of grain and wine, oil and honey, and of all the produce of the field, And they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. And the children of Israel and Judah, who dwelt in the cities of Judah, brought the tithe of oxen and sheep, also the tithe of holy things, which were consecrated to the Lord their God, they laid in heaps. In the third month they began laying them in heaps. And they finished in the seventh month. So four months they laid these things in heaps. And when Hezekiah and the leaders came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people Israel. Then Hezekiah questioned the priests and the Levites concerning the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest from the house of Zodok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat and have plenty left. 
for the Lord has blessed his people. And what is left is this great abundance. Now Hezekiah commanded them to prepare rooms in the house of the Lord, and they prepared them. Then they faithfully brought in the offerings, the tithes, and the dedicated things. Kenoi the Levite had charge of them, and Shemai, his brother, was the next. So again, we talked about the produce of the land, the fruit of the land. We talked about sheep. Here it talks about the oxen and sheep. Talk about all these things of the oil. They, they gave a tithe, a tithe of everything, 10% to them. And again, they, they started storing things up in heaps on the third month. And God's people continue to give. And what that allowed then was for them to take care of God's people. God's servants, those Levites, the priests, they were able to be taken care of by fellow uh, God's people, by fellow believers. And so we see that God blesses them. God's approving of such thing. He, again, doesn't turn their abundance of giving and that, well, we shouldn't be storing these things up in heaps. Uh, but then here towards the end, you can see that they're going to now go and store them elsewhere in those rooms in the house of the Lord. An outpouring of generosity. Someone had reminded me and said it, but Scripture again tells us that if you uh, sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. And if you sow uh, abundantly, you reap abundantly. And so if we can understand that principle, again, as you and I give to God, to keep that in mind. Again, there is no right or wrong, uh, 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 and there's no comparison that ought to be made between fellow Christian, fellow brother or sister in Christ, uh, uh, of the dollar amount, the dollar amount you give, the amount of time I give, the amount of time you give. But as we have the opportunity, as we have the ability to give back to the Lord, so it is each and every one of us ought to do that. We ought to do what we can, what we, are, we, what we have been given. So may we keep that in mind. Again, if we have our focus upon God, if we have God as the priority in our life each and every day and in each and every act of worship, then again, uh, that will help keep us focused on the right things. Help keep us to continue to endure doing the right thing. So as we talk about God's approval, we want to uh, turn to Malachi. You turn and look at Malachi chapter 3, 8 through 10. Now we're going to talk about God's challenge to his people. The challenge to God's people. We see that God was uh, accepting uh, his approval of the outpouring of generosity. But again, there may be those who were holding back from God. And that's where this passage starts off discussing. Malachi chapter 3, 8 through 10. It says this. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. These people, they were commanded to give offerings. These people were commanded to give tithes. But of while they perhaps give so much unto the Lord, they would hold back. And what he's telling these people is to give.